which uh, Al Stray, one of our librarians, picked up when the uh, IGA closed at the plaza. And people have been standing outside here, young people, older people, having conversations about street still 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. It's absolutely wonderful. So people of all ages are just interested in, in who we are, where we came from, what was it like here how many years ago? <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I think it speaks for itself that people really are interested in, in who's in, where street still has been, and where we're going. And we're so lucky to have Tom here, who has volunteered to give the slide demonstration, the uh, slide presentation of uh, Streetsville and our uh, battle with the lawn bowlers, which I think is uh, <laughs> It's so cool. I don't know. I, think it could, I, I keep saying, I'm going to write the green, and this could be on a skit on the red page. <laughs> yeah, anyway, without further ado, I'd like to present Tom Urbaniak. Everybody give him a Streetsville round. Thank you very much, Sandy. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, well, uh, with uh, today's opening ceremony, there was what may at first glance have appeared to be a little bit of a break with uh, tradition, although perhaps not, because this was a reopening rather than an opening. But uh, the Streetsville Library, as John mentioned uh, during his uh, brief remarks, uh, was housed in many different buildings, and often whenever uh, it moved from one building to another, or when this building was constructed for it, there would be a blessing for the new, uh, for the new building. And uh, that, of course, was what, uh, in Streetsville was you know, just part of the tradition, but it also had something to do with the very roots of, of the library. Uh, in, the 1880, in the late 1880s, uh, the, uh, the board of the Farmers and Mechanics Institute, which was really the library at that time, and we'll get into a little bit more of that later, uh, decided uh, that their best marketers to get people into the library and reading were the ministers. So this is just an excerpt from uh, the minutes uh, from uh, 1888, if I'm not mistaken. And this is courtesy of uh, Mary, Mary Manning, the late Mary Manning, in her book, uh, A Village Library Grows. Some conversation followed on the best means to increase the membership and popularity of the Institute, that's the Farmers and Mechanics Institute. And suggestions were made of canvassing the farmers. They didn't like that. <laughs> Dr. Oakley moved that as our ministers had the most effective influence on their respective congregations, and if they could feel with their peculiar sensitiveness an obligation to exert this influence in favor of the Institute, the result would be an unprecedented influx of new members. Therefore, he had no hesitation in moving that each reverend director, the reverends were actually members of the board, feel an, an obligation to stir up in their respective charges an insatiable thirst for literature and to direct the sufferers to this library. <laughs> so welcome, <Jeez>. sufferers. <laughs> OK, let's, uh, let's get a move on. Uh, I promise to try to keep this to an hour. And I know the library closes at 5 o'clock. So you won't be out of here before then, I assure you. Just the streets folk who are not from the streets folk. They think of a quaint, idyllic, quiet community. Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> Streetsville has been the hotbed of conflict uh, almost since it became uh, a settlement of any notable size. So here's the old town hall, also the former grammar school, uh, kind of a monument to uh, idyllic Streetsville. But over the next uh, hour, maybe a little less than an hour, I will uh, take you through some of the conflicts from Streetsville's colorful history. Uh, we'll hear about Librarians versus lawn bowlers, Tories versus rebels, uh, protesters versus the premier, denizens versus developers. Uh, the first half will deal with some of the more ancient history, so to speak, of Streetsville, and then I will uh, deal with the, the greatest battle of all, the battle royal in Streetsville, the battle to keep Streetsville as a municipality, uh, which was lost in 1973 when the Legion of Penal Act uh, was passed and uh, it became clear that Streetsville would be part of the new city of Mississauga. It's uh, Streetsville's town press, which actually just came into being in 1973, uh, very much at the last minute. Uh, but that was one of the ways in which people wanted to uh, remember the town. And of course, this is a site we won't see anymore. Uh, <laughs> the new library is night and day, actually, compared uh, to the old one. But this library, uh, the unrenovated Streetsville Library, opened in 1967, 
uh, after incredible uh, political conflict. And here is a somewhat unfortunate politician who was at the center of this conflict, <laughs> Bill Tolton, the now late Bill Tolton, who uh, passed away on December 26, 2002. Um, he was mayor of Streetsville in 1966 and 67, a progressive mayor in many respects, someone who had progressive ideas. And one, uh, the major project of his mayoralty was the development of this new library. Why did it create so many problems for Bill Tolton and such a rift within the community? Well, before I get into that, I'll just show you actually the program from, this was a happy day for Bill Tolton. If you were, any, if you were actually already by this time knew that he had lost the election, uh, that he would not be on the 68-69 council, but he was here and this was his legacy. So it's a bit unfocused, uh, but uh, it just lists the council and the library board. And here, maybe I will focus this a little, so you can see. Honor, Honorable W.G. Davis. Mm -hmm. And in 1967, here's a skill testing question, what position did Bill Davis hold in 1967? Mm -hmm. Minister, Minister of Education. Minister of Education, that's right. Mm -hmm. And also the uh, the member of the legislature for Peel North, which included Streetsville. And this will be very important as we get, uh, continue with our discussion. All right, that's where the library was before. The uh, building is still standing. Uh, this is not the very first building for the library, as John Emerson and the Streetsville Historical Society would, would definitely announce. Uh, but this was where the library was housed between 1902 and 1967. And uh, what's beside that uh, that building to this day? Oh, that's that's where the problem starts to come. Okay. Here's what happened. In 1965, there was a plebiscite, and the people of Streetsville voted in favor of building a new library. But this would be their centennial project. So everybody thought that was an open and shut case, and that they would just knock down this building and build a big library in its place. The uh, lawnmowers were told that they would have a new facility uh, at Memorial Park. In fact, the site at Memorial Park had been secured some years prior because already some people were thinking ahead to a new uh, and improved library. That seemed all right at first, uh, but then the separate school board expropriated the site on which the lawn bowlers were supposed to have their new lawn bowling green. So suddenly the lawn bowlers became very assertive. Uh, they realized that they didn't have a very practical place to go anymore. So then they started pointing to the deed by which they were leasing the land on the Memorial Park site, which was now being expropriated, as well as the deed by which this property had been given to the municipality by the Cunningham family in 1902, and they were finding all kinds of neat little provisions uh, showing that if, if they did not in fact have a legal entitlement to remain there as long as they wanted to, uh, they could make life very difficult for the municipality by basically uh, ensuring that the municipal, well, for one, that the expropriation money would go to the lawn bowling club rather than the municipality. Anyway, it was all a very uh, tangled uh, series of events. And as a result, Bill Tolton had to negotiate, or thought he had to negotiate for another site and negotiate for this site. Some of his critics thought that he did not get a very good deal for this site. In fact, he did, and the Graydon family was rather generous in, in, uh, in uh, the price of sale for this site. Here uh, is a cartoon. I think this just goes to show you. This is in the Mississauga News uh, in 1966. <laughs> and this just goes to show you how much of an issue this had become. First of all, look, look at who the cartoonist was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm going to move over to make sure there's no opportunity of viewing here. Um, it says, uh, let's compromise. You let us build the library here, and in it we'll put green broadroom, wall to wall, and a large supply of round books. I'm sure the editorial cartoonists uh, were are able to win. This just illustrates yeah. that there seemed to be no room for compromise yeah, right. uh, between these two parties. 
so that's a little bit about uh, the, the battle between the librarians and the lawn rollers in, uh, in 19, uh, well, leading up to 1967. It, it's a fascinating issue. I wish I had more time to speak about it, but I want to speak about other conflicts involving the library briefly. Um, one of the issues that has come up every now and then is uh, the uh, equality of the sexes vis-a-vis uh, -vis library employment uh, or library board membership. Now, in the early years, when the Farmers and Mechanics Institute was running things, as of 1854, before it still became officially a public library, um, this was a male dominant, in fact, initially male only uh, operation. Equality of the sexes meant, uh, the battle for equality of the sexes that time meant ensuring that women could have a role within the library. Uh, now, this is the year back in the 70s, 1972, and uh, Street Thrill. Uh, was able to hire a male employee to work at the library, and they saw that as a move towards equality of sex. So you see how uh, things had changed in those hundred years. Uh, this was uh, another event not too long ago. A um, hundred years of the Streets of the Library was celebrated in 1995. Now, if they wanted to date the library back to the start of the Farmers and Mechanics Institute, in fact, we could be celebrating the 150th anniversary uh, next year. And in fact, uh, Mary Manning and others in their research on the library um, even date informal library type services earlier than 1854. Uh, so people like Reverend McGeorge, uh, the famous Reverend McGeorge at the Anglican Church were very much involved in promoting um, uh, literacy within the community. Well, let's hope that, that the library is kept cleaner than this. Um, this was an incident of vandalism in the library in 1974. Uh, I don't think the vandals stole very much, but they were just very mischievous in how they went about things. But uh, hopefully the architects are taking care of, of security in, in their uh, renovation of this site. Okay. That's a little bit about the library. Let's let's go back in history before the Farmers and Mechanics Institute and talk about some of the other uh, conflicts in uh, in Streetsville's history. Again, the thesis statement being Streetsville was not just idyllic and quiet, but very uh, conflictual and sometimes even hot-headed. Now, speaking of people who had a reputation for being hot-headed, uh, and some people would disagree with what I just said, this, this remains controversial to this day. William Lyon Mackenzie. Okay someone who's uh, studied in the schools uh, to this day. William Lyon Mackenzie knew Streetsville very well. Uh, Streetsville was a polling place uh, for many years, uh, including while he was running for the Legislative Assembly in the late 1820s uh, and early uh, 1830s. He was a reformer. He stood up against what was called the Family Compact. I'm sure many people have heard of Family Compact, uh, a tight group of uh, elites, uh, high Tory elites, they were called, who were running uh, the province of Upper Canada uh, at the time. Now, Streetsville itself, uh, now sometimes Streetsville actually did give its votes to Mackenzie. By 1836, it was not voting in the majority for Mackenzie, although his supporters claimed that the elections were all being fixed and the corruption was rampant. Uh, but Streetsville itself had uh, fierce partisans for Mackenzie and fierce partisans for the Tories. Uh, and that's why things would get a little bit heated uh, sometimes even a little bit violent here. One recalls, for example, the 1833 Battle of Mother Hyde's Hostelry. <laughs> uh, Mother Hyde was uh, identified as being someone who was sympathetic uh, to Mackenzie, to the reformers. Now, there was another group of people who were not only sympathetic to uh, anti-reformers, but uh, were willing to show that physically, and they were called the Town Line Blazers. Now, the Town Line Blazers got their name because a lot of them actually came from just west of here, where the Town Line was, Winston Churchill now. And on one day in 1833, by some accounts, July 12th, the <laughs> they decided that uh, it would be scandalous for these reformers to have a celebratory dinner at Mother Hyde's hostel, you know, and they were apparently celebrating uh, McKenzie, a victory that Mackenzie had scored in Streetsville and surrounding districts um, six months earlier in the election. So they showed up just as this dinner was about to start. By some accounts, uh, Justice Malcolm McKinn was uh, doing the Gaelic uh, grace, 
uh, and uh, a food fight ensued for about a quarter of an hour. The reporters were thrown out of Mother Hyde's hostelry, and whatever food was left on the table was enjoyed by the town line blazers and not uh, the reformed friends of Mother Hyde. Right? That's a bit about the Orange versus the Rebels. Now, here's a hard picture to see. Um, this is John Street, the first read of the village of Streetsville. Um, Streetsville was, of course, around before 1858 when it was incorporated. Uh, but once it was incorporated, then it had its own reeve and council. And John Street was the first reeve. He was the son of Timothy Street, after whom Streetsville uh, is named. Uh, Timothy Street wasn't actually the first settler in Streetsville, but uh, he was the ambitious guy who uh, arranged all the surveying around here. And he himself and his family moved here about 1825. Uh, his son was, was John Street. Uh, by the accounts I've looked at in some of the uh, historical society uh, people, John Emerson or uh, Kay Matthews, who leads a wonderful walking tour of streets, will make correct me on this, but by what I've heard, he was uh, a pretty sober guy. He was a pretty straight-laced uh, type of person. Uh, although, um, he uh, had to, in the early 1850s, he was dealing with the fallout of some of his father's um, financial arrangements. Uh, eight, the 1820s were boom times for uh, Timothy Street, as, and as Streetsville was getting started. Uh, the 1830s were a different story. Well, instead of uh, rambling on about uh, Timothy Street and his family, let me just read you an excerpt uh, from a poem uh, that I wrote for the 225th birthday of Timothy Street, a poem that was read at a recent event of the Mississauga Heritage Foundation. Now, now although Street's efforts had ignited a remarkable boom, much darker clouds on the horizon inevitably did loom. Let's not forget the horrible 1832 election race. The result for Timothy Street was surely a disgrace. He ran against William Lyon McKenzie, whom you met a minute ago, who had a high profile for sure. But how Timothy managed just one vote, it's really quite obscure. <laughs> there were civil disputes over property and neighbors over losses and damages and the fruits of Timothy's labor. Some of those disputes continued after his death. Death mounted, debts mounted, and the family's prosperity began to diminish. Luckily, others ensured the whole village would languish. By 1840, Timothy, who had been full of ideas, energy, and wit, had become ill. He was even declared to be mentally unfit. <laughs> and that was a formal medical declaration. Okay, more battles. This is a battle between Streetsville and other uh, communities in the vicinity over railways, where railways were to be situated. And this was absolutely crucial to the future economic success of any community. Back in 1851, when John Street was trying to find partners for some of his business operations, he was boasting in his ads that the Toronto and Guelph Railway will probably be coming through Streetsville. Well, the Toronto and Guelph Railway did not come through Streetsville. It was only 1879 before a railway came through Streetsville, the Credit Valley Railway. And this, uh, this was a problem. In 1858, Streetsville had 1,500 people. It was considered the queen of the county. By the time this railway came through, its population was probably down to about 800 or 700 or so. And it remained stagnant until after World War II, when, of course, the suburban uh, era, the suburban sprawl began. There's another vantage point. There's the Pacific Hotel. Streetsville was home to, uh, to many hotels. And because it was home to many hotels, it was home to liquor. And because it was home to liquor, it was home to uh, advocates of temperance and advocates who were not so uh, enamored with temperance. <laughs> and they climbed up on top of the water tower to take that picture. <laughs> so the anti-temperance people know how did that. Okay. Speaking of conflict, uh, Streetsville contributed greatly, uh, and this is on a more serious note here, to uh, uh, both world wars. And here's a 1915 photograph of uh, volunteers uh, leaving from Streetsville. And the caption says, God help the Germans. <laughs> um, 16 
uh, young men from Streetsville didn't return from World War I, and their names are engraved on the Senate Cap, which is right in the middle of Main Street. Uh, eight did not return from World War II. And that rather parallels uh, the Canadian statistics, and that for Canada, World War I was uh, a more deadly war than World War II. Uh, we lost 67,000 Canadians in World War I and 43,000 in World War II. There's some more uh, images of uh, some volunteers, no doubt, thinking that they'd be home in a few months, uh, waiting for a railway. Okay, this is already after the war, this is victory. Um, it's hard to see, but uh, there's actually a floral arrangement there with letters. Sure, I can draw here. I think if it did, we could it I wonder if that's emergency lighting. Uh oh, there's a switch here. There's a floor arrangement here, and uh, it spells uh, the word peace. And uh, that's a sentiment I think we all can, uh, can hope for and share at this difficult time. No. For us, no. mm -hmm. Especially happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Odd Fellows Hall, uh, which itself was actually the site of uh, a library for a time. Um, but that's not why I have it here. Um, I have it here to illustrate the fact that the Streetsville was home to its share of pranks and pranksters. And one that uh, some of the old timers in Streetsville remember, which used to happen uh, on or about Halloween night, uh, was that uh, the wagons um, of uh, some of the uh, farms or some of the nearby homes, and even well into the era of automobiles, people still had some of these wagons or slaves or whatever, uh, they would mysteriously disappear uh, from uh, their owner's uh, homes, and they would appear, guess where? On top of this building. Somehow they would disassemble it to take it up and reassemble it up there. <laughs> Oh, yeah? I hear something. Si I hear something similar has been happening or has happened at the University of Toronto President's mm -hmm. office. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a somewhat of a, a chilling story, uh, and brought Streetsville national notoriety. Look at the headline here, and believe it or not, this headline is not referring to this picture. <laughs> but this headline is referring um, to an event in Streetsville. The Streetsville Ghoul Scare of 1937. This is from the Toronto Star, October 14, uh, 1937. And what had happened at this time was that at the Streetsville Cemetery, uh, there was a grave robber. Uh, the uh, the young, uh, young man had died, 20-year-old Hayden Pope, and uh, his, uh, well, basically the casket or box uh, was missed. The body was missing, uh, and everybody was wondering, you know, who, who did this, and they were finding remnants uh, around town, and they eventually did find the body a few days, uh, a few days later. Uh, and the uh, perpetrators, the unknown perpetrators, it's a crime that's unsolved to this day, uh, were referred to as the, the streets of ghouls. And there, and there were media from all over the country here to cover this. In fact, the, the Reed was uh, writing letters uh, begging people to kind of leave streets going in peace because they were looking to interview anyone and everyone over this uh, tragic uh, series of events. And at one point, um, the perpetrators, or some, some people posing as the perpetrators, uh, wrote uh, a note. And it, they actually found the body before they got, or just at the same time as they got the note. Um, and this is what the note said. Obviously, you could see that the spelling is not very good, uh, but some people thought that that was just a diversion. Uh, there are many theories as to who might have done it. Um, grave robberies did happen from time to time, although not not so much this late, uh, in this late an era, but did happen from time to time by medical students. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, very few people donated their bodies for research. Uh, this was just something people shied away from. This was a taboo thing to do. And so the medical students thought that, figured that they needed 
which I'm bonds to research. And this was very common, actually, that the graves would be uh, dug up, although 1937 is rather late for that. However, that theory was out there. Some conspiracy theorists said that um, it was uh, people uh, who make concrete vaults who arrange for this uh, to happen. Concrete vaults were very new on the market at this point. Uh, and the conspiracy theorists thought, okay, this would, these kinds of events might convince people that they ought to you know, lock up the casket securely uh, and uh, they maybe perpetrated this kind of uh, a widely publicized crime. Well, Tom used to be able to go down to Madame Tussauds in Niagara. Yes. Mm -hmm. I remember in grade school going down, and we were celebrities, right? Because yeah. Street Tell Gold now is no longer there, but we were, we, were, we were on the map, you know? Right, there was a display, yes, but thanks for mentioning that. Louis Tussauds Wax Museum. Okay. Well, speaking about things that put Street Tell in a rather bad light, this is something from 1965. Uh, this was actually before the Official Languages Act, uh, but already by this time, federal facilities were becoming bilingual, and that included the post office uh, in Streetsville. Now, some not-so-broad-minded people in Streetsville objected to having French uh, on the sign outside the post office, if you know the post. Um, and there was quite a thing over this. They, at first, the sign appeared in both languages. Uh, and uh, and it said Bureau de Poste, Streetsville, Post Office. Uh, then they erased the French, so then it said Streetsville Post Office, but then this caused a bit of a kerfuffle because, you know, this was supposed to be a progressive thing, and it was a progressive thing, that both official languages were being used throughout the country, so the federal government demanded it back, but then it said Post Office, Streetsville, Bureau de Poste. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this cartoon, again by our friend Donato, uh, kind of uh, again illustrates this issue for us. Uh, and the, what the point he's trying to get across here is that the street is being rather petty about this. And the caption says, uh, Ah, no, this is back, uh, up in Ottawa, we're talking about this whole situation. Ah, no, that's a fly spec. The one next to it, that's street <laughs> <laughs> And that and, um, the, the wall, the concrete wall where that sign was originally attached, now has nothing on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that wall still? Yeah, it's the small wall at the north end of the front of the building. Thanks for Okay, let me talk now about uh, Streetsville's Battle Royal, as I called it earlier, the battle to preserve itself as a municipality. Um, and uh, this uh, relates directly to uh, the research that I did for the, for the book Farewell Town of Streetsville, and this is uh, an outline of the chapters um, in Farewell Town of Streetsville. So it deals with the political aspect, but also uh, some of the other uh, accomplishments that uh, Streetsville had to its credit in its waning days as a municipality. I won't talk about all of these uh, seven myths, uh, but one of the things that I uh, tried to do in my research after I had done enough research and realized that there were some things, and some common perceptions that were not accurate, I tried to uh, dismantle some myths. Uh, and a key one being that Streetsville's opposition to amalgamation, this is a key myth, was driven by a fundamental resistance to change, as well as a small town suspicion of the big government trend. And I argue that that was not the case for Streetsville. In fact, Streetsville's opposition to amalgamation had more to do with the urban reform movement, which had really gained ground by that point, similar to the Stop Spadina Expressway movement, uh, which successfully had the Spadina Expressway halted at Edmonton Avenue in 1971, uh, similar to the, the John Sewell and David Crombie movement that was becoming very prominent on Toronto City Council. So it was a kind of quality of life ethic. Uh, it was a situation of Streetsville um, saying that uh, we didn't quite like the way things were evolved. The Streetsville perceived Mississauga as being run by big developers. Streetsville perceived itself as not being run by big developers, but as being a more democratic kind of community. And that kind of drove, in many respects, the opposition to amalgamation. There were other elements to it, too, but that was an important one. Uh, and in part for that reason, a lot of the most uh, outspoken opponents of amalgamation were not those who had lived in Streetsville and whose family had lived in Streetsville for generations, but many who had moved to Streetsville as adults 
within the past 20 or 30 years prior uh, to this event. Now, an interesting thing, I don't want to get too much into uh, political philosophy and political science, but an interesting thing that, that really strikes me is that remember I talked earlier about William Lyon McKenzie and how he had uh, the reformers and the Tories battling against each other, the radicals and the Tories, in other words? Well, it seemed that by this time, the radicals and the Tories had kind of morphed into the same movement, a kind of movement of Tory radicalism, a Tory radicalism that was opposing um, some of the aspects of kind of modern industrial, post-industrial uh, society. Okay, there's someone, there's someone the This was her official photograph from 1965 when she ran, when she ran uh, for Deputy Reeve of Streetsville. That was the first election in which Hazel McCallum ran, and she lost. And she lost uh, to George Parker, whose name will go down in history because he was the only politician and only candidate ever to beat Hazel McCallum. <laughs> Hazel McCallion had a few things to her credit uh, going into this 1965 election. She was um, editor of the Streetsville Booster, the very feisty editor of the Streetsville Booster. Um, now, the library issue hadn't reached ahead by this point, but when it did reach ahead, remember she had lost the election, so she still had a lot of time to write feisty articles. Um, when it did reach ahead, uh, Hazel McCallion was one of the uh, sharpest critics of then Mayor Bill Fulton. And in fact, when Hazel McCallion ran for mayor in late 1969, Bill Tolkien ran against her for mayor. Uh, and it was a relatively close election, uh, but Hazel McCallion was successful and was mayor of Streetsville, the last mayor of Streetsville, from 1970 to 73, although she was on council as of 1968 as deputy leader Reed. Another battle that uh, Hazel McCallion had uh, been involved with uh, in the months leading up to that first unsuccessful election was one that she waged as president of the Streetsville and District Chamber of Commerce. Um, and that was to end Streetsville's dry status. That was the wet, the wet dry thing of 1965. And the wet force is won, and uh, so, street, uh, so uh, liquor could then be sold on licensed premises after that uh, victory. Uh, with which Hazel McCallion had, had a lot to do. There is, I don't know if anybody recognizes yeah, him. Great. Yes, there is the, uh, the arch nemesis politically of Hazel McCallion. Oh. <laughs> our, our image of this, uh, Jack Ray is still around, and he's a, he's a lawyer. He doesn't live in, in this area anymore. Uh, but you know, even to this day, you still get a sense of uh, the, the kind of the bad blood that developed between these two uh, politicians. Now, when I interviewed Hazel McCallion for the book, I asked her, well, what caused this, uh, this bad blood to, uh, to take hold between Wind and Jack Graham? And she thought about it for a moment, and she goes, you know, I think it had to do with, guess what? The Lawn Bowling Club. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it had, I get it's a complicated series of events, but it had to do with the neighbor of the Lawn Bowling uh, Club, uh, Mr. Brocklebank, who was himself a lawn bowler, but he was in a dispute over where fences should go. And this whole thing led to uh, a lot of acrimony on the Streetsville Council. Now, uh, there were bigger fish to fry in terms of the, uh, the conflict that went on between these two uh, elected officials. Uh, and that uh, certainly around the issue of amalgamation. Jack Graham was in favor of amalgamation. Uh, one of the very few uh, public leaders in Streetsville who was in favor of amalgamation. And Hazel McCallion was, of course, opposed to amalgamation. Uh, although her views had evolved over the years. Um, in, uh, in uh, 1966, for example, she spoke very positively about the Plunkett Report. I won't get into too much detail, but the Plunkett Report was a document that was commissioned by the provincial government, later rejected by the provincial government, uh, which basically recommended that all the urban and urbanizing areas in Halton and Peel join to form one single large uh, municipality. So it would cover what's now Birmingham, Oakville, Mississauga, part of Brampton, that one one tier municipality. Um, and that's what, uh, because it was such a radical recommendation, it just never went anywhere. But Hazel McCallion at first thought positively of it, even though it would have, of course, resulted in the uh, disappearance of Streetsville as a municipal entity. <laughs> 
Now, in part, this, this, this the, her kind of, the evolution of her views uh, is symbolic of the evolution of the community's views, too, because the Streetsville Residents Association uh, thought the Plunkett report was good. A few years later, though, they realized that if we're going to be uh, consistent with our reform, quality of life type ethic, then maybe the, these amalgamations are not a good thing. Maybe we have in Streetsville, or have the potential to create, and we are creating, a progressive, competent administration um, that, that seems to be beholden to a very large cross section of the population, rather than, as again was the perception, to big developers. And this was, of course, the perception about how Mississauga was being run uh, in those days. Okay, and there's the uh, last uh, town council of, uh, of Streetsville. Mm -hmm. And that photo actually is upstairs in this very live room. Jack Graham, uh, Robert Wiley. Uh, uh, his back, I apologize for that. Uh, Fred Donnelly, uh, Ted Ray, Doug Spencer, uh, Jim Watkins, uh, Graydon Petty, and Fred Kings. <laughs> Streetsville even had its own uh, police force. It's a little bit hard to see, but uh, here is Don Fletcher, the uh, chief. Ted Rutledge, the deputy chief. We have been, Ted Rutledge, of course, I've been associated with the police force for a long time. Uh, uh, that's Georgina Cooper, and uh, she was not a police officer, but she was uh, basically an administrative assistant to the police at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah
1968, Streetsville commissioned uh, the most comprehensive study that it ever commissioned, the Boundary Study. Uh, and for $20,000, $20,000 later, they reported that these should be, uh, the consultants reported that these should be Streetsville's boundaries. And uh, Streetsville endorsed that. Although in 1973, it somewhat departed from this view. It was even more ambitious in 1973. Those are the boundaries wow. of Montana. Wow. <laughs> Today, that, it would have about 200,000 people. The city of Streetsville would be for sure. <laughs> if development continued in the same way that it has. What's one of the reasons why they changed this from the boundary study? Why is this more ambitious? Well, did you notice where the actual town of Streetsville was in the boundary yeah, study? Right, right on the edge of this expanded area. Well, this was a problem because the consultants were telling people, well, we're going to be building a city center right down here, near where Aaron Mills Town Center is. So the merchants started to think, well, what happens to us? We're no longer going to be in the center of gravity. So uh, in part to assuage any potential concerns of that nature, in 1973, when Streetsville submitted its counter-proposal to the provincial government, it proposed that these be the boundaries. It actually offered two options. It said, we could settle with that. We, we might be willing to not take that one, right? but, but they, they were adamant about that. Now, some people look at that and say that this was, uh, you know, this might have been very unrealistic, it just high in the sky. But to, people were taking this very seriously, I mean, in terms of, uh, well, within the communities, also, but it's in, also in terms of analysis outside the community. Uh, and even some people within the provincial government were taking this very seriously. Uh, in fact, even before Streetsville made this particular proposal, I, in the provincial archives, I dug up some internal memoranda that were going on, and one of the options that they were looking at quite seriously was to have uh, an expanded Streetsville that would basically be all of this. Um, so we're taking the airport. <laughs> 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 One of the reasons why this, they, were, they were talking about that behind the scenes, although this never uh, flew anywhere, but one of the reasons why they were talking about this was, and the problem is with us today, if we have a new region of Peel, think about the municipalities that are in the region of Peel today, Mississauga, Brampton, Calgary. Which one has two thirds of the population, or just under two thirds now? Mississauga. Mississauga. Mississauga does not have that many, that same proportion of seats on the regional council. And they knew right from the start the provincial civil servants were warning this is going to be a problem. In fact, what the provincial civil servants wanted, but they were overruled by their political masters, was to have a halt in Peel region. But they said, well, if you can't have that, or, or one of the things they threw in was, well, maybe as an option, we could have a fourth municipality within Streetsville. And that's what Streetsville wanted. That's one of the arguments Streetsville was using. With a fourth municipality, eventually you could have representation by population without any one municipality having a majority of seats on the regional council. And this just uh, shows who voted for what uh, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, Lou Parsons' 1972 report I'm referring to here. This was very similar to what the province actually came up with. Uh, one should not interpret that as meaning that Lou Parsons drove the provincial agenda. It was a kind of a mutual thing going on before Lou Parsons' report got voted on. And of course, students were voted against because that would have been the uh, uh, students were being erased. Mississauga voted for, of course. Yeah. There's there's something crucial. And if there's ever a second edition of the book, I'm going to investigate yeah, this. Okay. That one vote from Brandon that went before. Because if that one vote had gone against, then although the weighted vote would still be in favor of amalgamation, the numerical vote would not be. You needed to get a numerical vote in favor. The vote would be 11 11 if that vote went over here. Mm -hmm. And that was Nance Forward, the then leave of Brandon. So it's interesting to discover you know, why she felt uh, so um, uh, enthusiastic about amalgamation. Ah, there are two important characters in this whole saga. Lou Parsons, right. Lou Parsons, uh, and again, as I said, it's kind of a two way street between uh, these two gentlemen and others, too, but these are very crucial things on what eventually happened to Streetsville and to Peel. Um, and even at some points, Lou Parsons was writing confidential letters to Bill Davis, urging him not to be swayed by Streetsville's powerful lobby, or you know, very spirited lobby. Uh, 
Uh, and in one of his confidential letters, no longer confidential because it's now discoverable in the archives, uh, said, you know, pay no heed to the lady mayor of street. <laughs> 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 Anyone know who this is? Anyone remember this face? This is John White. This was John White. He passed away about five years ago. Um, he was the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and so he, a part of his file was the amalgamation issue. Now, Hazel McCallion um, <coughs> believes that he, or she's quite convinced, that he was in favor of Scootsville's position, but he could not really get the sway within the cabinet. For one, he was the MPP for London South, and Bill Davis was the MPP for Pedro North. Uh, so, notwithstanding the issue of a premier being generally more influential than a minister, uh, here we also have the dynamic that the premier is from this area. And if the premier is willing to go back for the regional uh, government setup as he was, then that kind of uh, puts the minister in a difficult position. And I did dig up some documents at the archives which suggest that indeed he was sympathetic, very sympathetic to Street School's <coughs> Okay, let's leave politics behind uh, for now. <coughs> and let's talk about uh, some of the uh, accomplishments that allowed street sports to leave a legacy going into the new city of Mississauga. In other words, allowed some of the, uh, the conflict to be soothed uh, a little bit in the years to come. Now, this is not 1973, of course. Uh, this is the Toronto Township uh, Agricultural Fair, which took place for many years down in the park. I uh, just uh, included that here to uh, um, to acknowledge the fact that Streetsville was always the site of, uh, of many uh, public uh, events and fun activities. And 1973 was the first year for what? The Bread and Honey. Right. And here is the uh, Bread and Honey uh, Parade. The Parade Marshal, Frank Haddon, no longer with us, but he was the Marshal for many parades in Streetsville uh, in that era. Jack Graham uh, was the chair of the uh, Promotional Committee of Town Council, and he deserves a lot of credit for getting the Red and Honey Festival off the ground. Um, Sam McCallion became the charter president when the festival was incorporated in 1974, although he was brought into the uh, committee fairly late in the planning for the first festival. Uh, so in terms of the first festival, we have to give the spotlight to one particular person, who probably would be Jack Graham. And Sam McCallion, when he did come up with I should clarify, he did play a very good role. For many years. And for many years thereafter. Yeah. He stepped down as, uh, as president in uh, 1982, Sam McCallion did, uh, but even after the name during that. Another? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is that Jimmy Ray Box? Yeah. It must be. Yeah. Yeah. The second one is actually. Okay, yeah. yeah. You can still see it. It's yeah. very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So there'll be a couple in there from Ray Whaley. Oh, Ray Whaley. Well, Ray Whaley has a famous story. I don't know. I don't know if you can see anything from Ray Whaley here, but in one of the festivals, not the first one, uh, the story goes he's caught fire and uh, some local <laughs> restaurateurs have to come to the rescue. <laughs> Uh, I spoke with Jim Laidlaw before the Santa Claus Parade because this is one of the most interesting contraptions that's uh, in, the, uh, in the parade and, and he uh, talked about all the maintenance that has to go into that thing for even one hour of use and uh, he's got provincial inspectors uh, sniffing around uh, several times a year. It's really quite intensive. Tom Hitchcock fired too in the parade oh, and all the fire trucks were behind him. <laughs> 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 but anyway, somebody came rushing out with their hose and it was okay. We got yeah. <laughs> okay, there's the fire department. So there's, uh, my the the fire department, and this is the 1934 vehicle, I believe, yeah, uh, that was purchased by the department in 1939, and they still bring it up. Yeah, and that's my brother and Roy Coates. Okay, core 73. That was a big effort to spruce up the downtown in Streetsburg. Uh, it was a functional downtown. It was, it was uh, pleasant in some ways, but it was the perception was it was deteriorating. Sidewalks were substandard. Uh, paint was peeling. Uh, the signage was not too attractive. Some of the roads were not in, in the best of shape. 
Street School for some years had been trying to do something about this. And to do something about, guess what? The parking problem, even in the 1960s, this was already a problem, and the BIA is still talking about it today. There's no parking problem. One of the latest things that came up was uh, the, uh, the idea of putting in parking meters, but that's being resisted strongly, and I doubt, I doubt the parking meters will ever come to fruition. Anyway, Horse 73. Finally, in 1973, the year before amalgamation, also coincidentally the year that Street School was willing to use some of the surplus for some you know, legacy projects, but very coincidentally, uh, four students from the University of Waterloo, including one, uh, Doug Flowers, who lived just outside of Street School, did a project in which they proposed how a community could be beautified and refurbished in a realistic, uh, cost-effective way. Um, and the town loved it. And the town recruited those four students to uh, work on actually trying to make it happen. And they did make some of it happen in 1973. They had plans for what could have been done beyond 1973. Those plans were slow to materialize after 1973. Uh, but in the late 80s and 90s, we've seen some of those ideas and others uh, come to be. There's an example of... Uh, there's the downtown, as you well know. My favorite site that I'm there for one going to. <laughs> I personally don't remember, but uh, you know, Bailey, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unit, unit Bailey. Oh, absolutely. Mr. Martin, I just rebrought that. Martin's garage. There's our Odd Fellows Hall again. Uh, it was already used for art class type purposes by this time. Uh, the, uh, the art fellows gave up their hall in 1972, by the way. Uh, same, well, one year before the 100th anniversary of this place. It's Red Hill Art Class, Red Hill. Stained Glass Studio. Banquet Hardware, of course. Gord and Lauren Bentley. Uh, and their mother passed away in February. A very important and well respected person. Uh, passed away in December. The IGA, Bert Johnston was Mr. IGA in those days. What are the prices? Uh, 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 this was Whaley's menswear shop. No, no. no. I don't think it's actually an inn by this time. It used to be a furniture store back in Yeah, years. Yeah. Yeah. There's the Montreal House, the oldest commercial building in New York. Now, here's going to be a, a bit of a before and after change. And this is how it actually looked in 1973. And this is what the four University of Waterloo students thought it could look like. Not too extensive, modest changes. All their, all their proposed changes were, uh, were under $2,000, many of them well under $2,000. But, you know, it adds something to the town. And this is the kind of thinking that they went, that they had. And because it was a practical philosophy, uh, it managed to get their plans. What year was that? Um, the actual construction, yeah, would have been by the barn gates, I guess, in 1820. Streetsville was one of the first sites in Canada for interlocking brick sidewalks. Uh, here they are laying the sidewalk, the new sidewalk. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Now let's let's jump now back to some political conflict. 
Okay. Now we're getting towards the end of 1973, towards the end of Streetsville's life as a municipality. And of course, what had to happen before all that got finally sorted out? An election for the new city council in Mississauga. Here were the two arch rivals in that election, running for mayor, Chick Murray and Martin Dawkins. In a rare handshake. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Dobkin uh, was 31 years old at the time. He had no political experience. He was a, a family physician and also worked part of the time as a foreigner. Um, and he decided about a year and a half before the election, which was actually held on October 1st, 1973, although the elected people didn't actually take office to the 1st of 74. He decided a year and a half before the actual election that he thought he could run for me. And some people thought that he was just you know, not thinking that. But he thought he could run for me. He thought that the political climate was right. That people were getting frustrated uh, with the way Mississauga was being run. The perception again was that Mississauga was run by kind of a tight clique. Uh, with the, the big three developers, Mark Burrell, Aaron Mills, and McLaughlin, especially McLaughlin very much at the center of that, uh, of that group. And uh, Chick Murray was perceived as being uh, very sympathetic to uh, the big developers. And so Martin Dobkin ran on a reform plan. Uh, Chick Murray is no longer with us, but uh, his son, Jim Murray, who, by the way, something like Tart has a possible future candidate for mayor of his the son, um, has, uh, recalls that his father thought that when Martin Dobkin first signed up during the election, that he, that Martin Dobkin was a nuisance candidate. It was only late in the election that we started to worry that this that this candidate might actually have a serious shot at winning. And when he did, Martin Dobkin came from nowhere and won the race for mayor to become the first mayor of the city of Mississippi. Also, also running in that election was Frank Clarkson. Frank Clarkson lived just south of Street, well, still does, by the way. Um, he was uh, at the very end of the town of Mississauga's life, just before amalgamation. He was the reeve of the town of Mississauga. But the problem was that uh, the new city would have a mayor and nine wards, nine councillors. And two of the wards, Streetsville and Port Credit, or two of the wards were Streetsville and Port Credit. So this kind of put some of the Mississauga politicians uh, into a game of political musical chairs. And some of them were left without uh, a natural seat in which to run, including someone like Grant Clarkson, who was elected municipality. Well, I did not have to find a ward unless he was going to run for mayor. He never considered that. So where did he run? In the Streetsville ward against Hazel McCallum, which would be the first councillor representing Streetsville on the Mississauga City Council. Uh, Grant Clarkson was also active with the conservation authority. He's a lifelong conservationist. Um, and uh, he and Hazel McCallum got along fairly well, although you know, there were some rifts there. At one point in early 1973, Grant Clarkson was quoted in, uh, in a couple of the Toronto papers as calling Hazel a political warmonger. <laughs> because she blamed uh, flooding uh, along the Mullet Creek on the conservation authority. And Grant Clarkson believed that it was the fault of her administration. <laughs> Uh, Greg Larson lost, of course, uh, as you know, um, got 24% of the vote, and Hazel McCallion got 76% uh, of the vote. Hazel McCallion, of course, ran on a reform platform, very similar to Martin Dobkin's. In fact, Hazel McCallion and Martin Dobkin were allies on that first uh, city council. Now, Dobkin lost the election in 76 to uh, to Hazel. Ross. 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 Right. And Cyril lost to Hazel in 78. And the rest is history. <laughs> okay, um, now we're getting really close to the end for Streetsville. November 30, 1973. Okay, here's an invitation to a recognition dinner uh, that was held at the Vic Johnston uh, Community Center. It was already called Vic Johnston as of June of 1973. Right? Um, and uh, it was a very kind of Dignified event from all accounts that I've heard about it. Of course, I wasn't there. I was born in 1973, but <laughs> going on. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I'm going on uh, uh, 
reflections that others have so kindly shared with me. And I, am, by the way, I am, by the way, very grateful for all the assistance that I received from people. It's been wonderful. Um, but apparently, it was a very, uh, very great event, and they had a silver plate with the streets book press that was presented to all the members of the, uh, the boards and, uh, and commissions. Uh, and the employees of Streetsville. Um, there were uh, servers with white gloves serving wine. Uh, it was a very memorable event for all those who were there. Now we're beyond amalgamation. We're into legacy talk. One of the legacies was the Bread and Honey Festival. Now, some people say that the Bread and Honey Festival was supposed to be a farewell festival for Streetsville. Uh, that's not quite right. The thinking always was uh, that there would be an annual event like the Bread and Honey Festival. That's what the promotional committee chaired by Jim Graham had wanted. Uh, but certainly, the first one, by any stretch, would have been a kind of a test run. It would flop and they wouldn't have had it again. But it didn't flop. The first one was a great success. And so, uh, in 1974, they held it again and since, on the first weekend in June. Now, who was the guest of honor at the 1974 Streets for Brennan Honey Festival? Michael <laughs> Rose. <laughs> What's he doing here? He's standing inside a balloon. That's right, in a, on the basket of a balloon. And just to prove that Streetsville was still a political hotbed as late as 1974, and probably even to this day, but as late as 1974, its political instincts were still there. Uh, some of the people around him were, of course, uh, very exuberant, and uh, such a distinguished guest would be in their midst and give him a hearty applause. Other less sympathetic uh, onlookers shouted, cut the rope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the rope was not cut, and they went on to win the 1974 uh, federal election, with a, with a better result than the 1972 election. Of course, 1972 was just straight by uh, with the minority. The button, by the way, said, you really can. <laughs> All right. Now, this should be in color, actually, because this is very recent now. And this is uh, uh, July the uh, 1st, uh, 2000, 2000, yeah, okay, where the uh, millennium clock was unveiled. And the Senate cap, by the way, was also unveiled on July 1st, um, but the 74 years prior to this picture. 1926, and this is right beside the Senate cap. Just as an interesting anecdote, some of the people who, uh, a couple of people who were at the Senate cap unveiling in 1926 are still with us. That's, that's very nice. Is it <laughs> Okay. Well, that brings us very to the end. I'm just going to make a few uh, concluding remarks, but before I do, I'd like to thank the Streetsville Historical Society for some of the photos uh, that you see here, especially uh, the, early ones, the, the 19th century ones. Uh, I'd like to uh, encourage anyone who's interested in the history of Streetsville to speak with the Historical Society, maybe come out to some of the meetings, and also to attend Kay Matthews' superb walking tours of Streetsville. Kay is right here in the Exactly. Yes, I've been recruited to help with the <laughs> And I'd just like to read you a final quote. Um, and this was read at that uh, event in uh, 1973 on November 30th. Remember the one where they got those silver plates? And uh, Jim Graham, uh, who was the deputy, we talked about him, we've met him already today. Uh, and he wrote a, a prayer, a kind of poem slash prayer for the event uh, that kind of captured the, the sentiments of uh, people in Streetsville who really valued their town. Uh, and that was a feeling throughout the community. A town, its people, their laughter and tears, their labor and leisure, their hope and their fears. A place to share this gift of living, to become involved through an act of in a town, in a meeting, in a friendship, in a care. Tonight, we give thanks for the blessings we share. So let's continue to give thanks for the blessings as Streetsville continues through the 21st century. I thank you very much. I hope the library is still open. <laughs> <laughs> I will 